Welcome to the Inside the Box podcast, brought to you by Black Box Investigations and Appen Media Group. Dive into local issues important to the North Atlanta community, from politics and education to business and crime. Hear the story behind the story that you won't hear, read, or see anywhere else. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Inside the Box podcast. I'm your host, Hans Appen, and joining me on the show this week is former congressman and Democratic candidate for Secretary of State, John Barrow. Talk a lot about his family history here in the state of Georgia, uh, how that has shaped him as an elected official and now as a candidate. And then we also talk a lot about gerrymandering, both in the state of Georgia and across the country. So, It's a really interesting show, and I think you'll learn a lot about the importance of the role of Secretary of State and more about the candidate. Thanks for tuning in. All right, welcome to the Inside the Box podcast. I'm thrilled to be joined by Congressman John Barrow here today, actually in the studio here at the uh, App and Media Group uh, podcast studio. So, Congressman, thank you for being here. Glad to be with you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, in doing my research for the show, one of the things that I learned is uh, that you have a very long history. Your family has a very long history here in Georgia. And I, I think we could probably do an entire podcast just talking about that. But for our listeners, would you mind just giving them a little bit of background on your family history here in the state? Well, everybody has a long family history somewhere, but most folks don't know about it because we move around so much. I guess my family just stayed put for such a long time in the state after arriving fairly early. Uh, My family in this state goes back to um, before the Constitution. I'm the seventh generation on um, some of the same land in Oglethorpe County, Georgia, which used to be the western frontier for the old royal colony of Georgia. The athens Clark County and Oglethorpe County line used to be an international boundary between the royal colony of Georgia and the Creek and Cherokee nations. So that was, that was the western frontier in the 1770s and 1780s. My family goes back that far. Um, also have a long history uh, in my family with the University of Georgia because uh, we were settled real close to where the University of Georgia grew up in the wilderness at that time when John Millage and others uh, agreed they want to put this new academical village way out there in the middle of nowhere because they wanted to spare the the young men of the institution from the baleful influences of alcohol and the taverns in Watkinsville, <laughs> Georgia. So that was uh, that that was how things came to be in, in those days. It's changed a little since then. That's right. <laughs> uh, and my family's been active in the public life of the of the state for uh, all of the state's existence from from literally before the Constitution all the way through. Um, uh, most interestingly, most recently, my family's been involved in the in, in the public life in, in the city of Athens. Mm-hmm. Uh, my parents were leaders in the uh, civil rights movement. They worked uh, uh, publicly and uh, outwardly for the desegregation of the University of Georgia and the submission to a federal court ordered desegregation when many people were ex- you know, exerting all of their influence to try and oppose that. And my parents were the head of something called HOPE. Now, it's not the HOPE scholarship that we're familiar with, uh, with uh, under Zell Miller's leadership. This is a group that was formed in the late 50s and early 60s to oppose the state's preferred policy of resistance to federal court-ordered integration. The consensus view and the, and the, and the political uh, policy of the day was to basically threaten to shut down the public education system and essentially privatize it mm-hmm. rather than submit to integration. And my parents were leaders of what you might characterize as a a bipartisan group of people that consisted of people who uh, opposed segregation like my parents, but also some folks who were pro-segregationists, but they were pro-public education. Mm -hmm. They were opposed to this crazy idea of playing chicken with the federal courts. You order us to desegregate and we will shut down. That That was the stated policy of the government in those days. My parents were leaders in opposing that. And because they were the presidents of the chapter of this organization called HOPE, Help our public education. That's where the, that's the, okay. where the acronym came from. Because they were the, the presidents of the chapter that included the University of Georgia, they corresponded with the parents of every G- Georgia student in those days, and they got uh, some very encouraging feedback from quarters you might not have expected. But they also got death threats. Um, so my parents were out front during, during those days. As it happened, my daddy who was the closest thing to Atticus Finch in a 100-mile radius of Athens. 
in the opinion of most everybody. Uh, my daddy happened to be the judge who presided over the case that desegregated our public schools. Mm -hmm. And I was in the first class to go all the way through the thoroughly integrated public high school system in Clark County. So if you really want to know my background, you want to watch two movies, To Kill a Mockingbird and Remember the Titans. I was born in To Kill a Mockingbird, <laughs> and I graduated from, from Remember the Titans. Everything that happened in that movie, and those guys happened to our class and our generation. And uh, I was a part of that. That's, that's, the, that's my background. Okay. And I, I know that both of your parents served as officers during World War II. Absolutely. My mother had the more interesting uh, course because it was uh, my father uh, played a, a man's role in this. He, he enlisted early before the draft, uh, entered officer candidate school, became a, a commander of a tank destroyer battalion in, um, in, in the European theater of operation. Uh, very, very uh, deadly but, but effective service that he rendered. My mother, for her part, was the first University of Georgia graduate to enlist in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. And she was in the second officer candidate class for women in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, in the WACs. And she ended up in the Pentagon, um, in, you know, watching in, the, in, the, um, in the, de the department that was responsible for monitoring losses in Europe, as her fiancé and sweetheart, my daddy, was actually in that theater of operations. Mm -hmm. So they were, they were both mustered out with the rank of captain. I'm not sure who technically outranked the other, but I can tell you who was saluting the other most of, <laughs> most of, most of my lifetime. Uh, they were both very active public citizens. Mother was engaged in every uh, meaningful uh, movement to, uh, in, in our community after the war and, um, and was active in the Democratic Party for all of her adult life. My father, as I said, in, you know, ended up on the bench shortly after the desegregation of the University of Georgia and uh, played a more uh, a reserve role, played the role that was appropriate for a judge. But he had a lot of interesting cases that where he was a pioneer in many of the reforms and revolutions and constitutional law that were taking place during the 60s and 70s. And how have those experience and role models like your parents sort of shaped you into the candidate you are today for Georgia Secretary of State? I, I can't say because it's just what I was grown, what I grew up with. But I do know it must be very different for a, than it is for a lot of people who didn't grow up sitting around the table talking about the kind of revolutions that were going through our society in the '60s: the civil rights revolution, the women's rights revolution, the opposition to the, the, the policies that, that led to our our over engagement in Vietnam, and, and how that and how our soldiers were treated when they came back. I mean, we 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 talked about all these issues at the table. It was just. It was just what we did. We were just actively involved in both the, 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 the national issues of the day, but also the local and statewide issues. We, we, we knew a lot of the people who were prominent in the public life of the state. My father had the privilege of, of teaching an awful lot of really fine future leaders who benefited from the GI Bill. My mother and daddy didn't benefit much from the GI Bill because their formal education was completed just before the war. But right after the war, my father taught a whole generation of lawyers who became judges, governors, uh, leaders in the state legislature, leaders in the business community of the state. Because in those days, it was a much smaller mm -hmm. uh, universe of people who had to pass through that uh, that that passageway on their way to, to the, the role they were going to play in their later lives. So we just felt like we were very privileged to be sort of in a in a uh, a fulcrum for public influence in the future. Okay. I want to ask you a little bit about gerrymandering. Huh. If you would, for our listeners, could you give kind of a, a, a synopsis of what gerrymandering is and why you have a personal history and, and, a, and a few <laughs> things to say about it as well? Well, in short, gerrymandering is the process whereby the politicians who are in charge at any given place and time draw up the district line so that they get to choose their voters. And they also get to choose the opposition's voters and get to decide where they live and what lines are drawn around them to basically advantage whatever party happens to be in power at the moment. It's politicians choosing their voters. And not just both sides choosing their voters, one side choosing the voters for each side in the districts that they're going to have to run in. And that's that may sound kind of neutral until you realize what you do with that power. When politicians are choosing their voters, what they do is they spread, they know, they take their voters and they know where their voters are because of the incredible 
amount of technological information is now available on all of us. We are we are an open book to folks who have access to Google and Amazon and all the other information that's available out there to folks who know how to access it. You take your voters and you know where they are and you spread them out in so that they constitute comfortable, reliable majorities in as many districts as possible. And you take the other side's voters and you the other team's voters, and you jam them and you pack them into the largest majorities possible in the smallest number of districts. And in that way, a party that may enjoy anywhere from, say, 52 to 55 percent of the popular support throughout the entire jurisdiction can get 60, 70, 75 percent of the seats in the legislature. Since both parties can do this wherever they're in power, both parties do do this wherever they are in power. And oftentimes, if you really scratch them, scratch the surface and really point out to them what this is doing to our politics, some of the more more sensitive ones will say, well, we have to do it wherever Mm -hmm. we can because the other side's doing it to us wherever they can. This Mm -hmm. is essentially the logic uh, and the morality of the nuclear arms race. Neither side can unilaterally disarm. Right. Because the other side won't. Mm-hmm. And what this poli- what this approach does is it what it does is it hollows out the middle in American politics. It, what it does is it it makes it uh, in, in almost impossible for a centrist majority of voters to dominate a sizable number of districts. Anything especially the number of districts that represents their share of the overall public opinion. And it means that our representative assemblies are extremely representative of the extreme wings of the two different parties, but extremely unrepresentative of the rest of us. Folks in the middle are underrepresented. Mm-hmm. Uh, not in, one other way of looking at it is 95% of the people in this country live in districts where the outcome of the general election is not in doubt. The person who's going to win the general election is the person who won the primary for whatever side that district was drawn to benefit or hurt. And so you can have these super majorities where folks are, you know, really strong on the minority side of of statewide politics. Uh, Same thing goes for Congress. And so what we got is a situation where our representatives are extremely representative individually of their districts. It's just that their districts are unrepresentative of the whole of, of, of the states they're carved out of or of popular opinion in general. This is why our politics has gotten so much more polarized than folks are used to. They've always played this game. And the oldest rationale for this is, well, the other side did it to us when they were in charge. So it's kind of, have kind, of, it's kind of our turn. Election, yeah, it's yeah. Not, it, this isn't about that. This is about how the way in which they're designing our districts are, are, is such at, that it actually makes it virtually impossible for a centrist to be elected or for enough centrists to be elected so they have a proportional role to play in our legislative assemblies. When I was a kid, something like half the members of Congress – came from districts where, that would vote, could vote either way in a presidential election. And I mean, did vote both ways mm-hmm. in, a, in the 1970s, for example. Something like half the members of Congress represented districts that voted for Richard Nixon in 72, Jimmy Carter in 76, and Ronald Reagan in 1980. Mm-hmm. All those elections were held under the same district lines. And yet you didn't have a fruit basket turnover in Congress with every one of those elections. You didn't have a huge turnover in 72, didn't have a huge turnover in 76, didn't have a huge turnover in 80. The members of Congress who represented those districts managed to survive those wild swings in their districts because they governed differently. Mm -hmm. They behaved differently. They were more bipartisan in their politics. So when their district went from one extreme to the other, they... They did a good job of representing that district, no matter which party they were in. This is this is hard for folks to believe mm-hmm. today, but that's what made that's what made our politics much more manageable in those days. Folks represented not just um, the the extreme wings. Yeah, you know, there was a, there was a lunatic fringe in Congress: twenty five percent on the far left and twenty five percent on the far right. But fifty percent of them were right in the middle. There wasn't anything wrong with these districts that voted for Nixon, Carter, and Reagan. You might think there must have been something wrong with them. Actually, they voted like the country did. Mm-hmm. 
Those districts were representative of the country as a whole. And the members of Congress who represented districts like that were successful in their representation because they governed that way. They, were, they had compromise in their DNA. Their districts expected folks to work together. And they had members of Congress who could do that when the time, when, when the time called for it. Can't say that today. Today, um, the districts, 95% of them are so set in terms of how they've been drawn that 95% of us really can't do anything about our member of Congress. Whether we love them or hate them, we can't do nothing about them because they're, 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 they're in like Flynn. Nothing you can do about it. And that, the difference between a Congress where 50% of the members practice the politics of cooperation and the other 50% is split between 25% who practice the politics of confrontation from the left and half of those, 25%, practice the confrontation of politics from the right. The difference between 50% in the middle and a quarter on the left and a quarter on the right and what we got today, which is 48% hardcore right, 52% hardcore left or vice versa, with nobody in the middle. That's the difference between the kind of politics we got today and the politics we had just 40, 30 or 40 years ago. Gerrymandering is the number one culprit, the avalanche of technology and the ease with which the map makers can draw districts made to order today greatly exceeds anything that's ever been possible in the past. That's why this, is, this has gotten so much worse in the, in, in the last few decades. Well, and technology is what it is. I don't think we're, we're turning back from a, a technologically advanced era of this country. So given that, what solutions do you see? Do you, do you see a solution to fixing this gerrymandering problem? You bet. Technology is a tool that can be used to promote this kind of partisan polarization, but it can also be utilized to neutralize it. Mm-hmm. If, for example, we use the same map making and voter identification and micro targeting techniques that are used today to draw a reliably Republican district and a reliably Democratic district, that same technology can be used to draw a district where neither side has a significant advantage over the other and where you can, you can maximize that in the largest number of districts possible. The only reason why we're not doing it is because the policymakers, the politicians in charge of the process, have no incentive to do that. But if they had a mandate from the courts, for example, to do that, there's no question that we can draw districts that could create uh, razor thin, virtually no majority f- for either one of the two warring tribes in a, in a majority of the districts in this country. And what that would do is it would completely revolutionize our politics. It would give, for example, independent voters in each of these districts a much larger, I would say a decisive say in the outcome of these elections. Right now, they don't have a say mm-hmm. because they're turned off by the parties. They don't participate in the primaries. And when the general election rolls around, they got to hold their nose and vote for the lesser of two evils. But if these folks had a, a real say, if they were the deciding vote, they would have the opportunity to decide how partisan is too partisan. Likewise, the parties would have a, an incentive to practice the politics of cooperation, to promote candidates who practice the politics of cooperation and compromise. The party that did a better job of nominating a candidate with some crossover appeal, something that's unheard of today, but the party that chose the course of nominating and getting behind somebody who actually had some crossover appeal would have an inherent advantage in such a district over the party that chose to nominate the most partisan, most extreme, most ultramaroon that you can come up with. That would give the parties an incentive uh, to move to the middle. It would also give candidates who, whose personal commitment, like mine, is to govern from the middle, to practice the politics of compromise and cooperation. It would give them an incentive to campaign like that in more, an opportunity to campaign like that in more districts because these districts would actually be capable of electing someone like that. We don't have districts like that now. And that's why we don't have very many politicians who, who, who work like that now. But if we use the technology that's currently being used to divide us and threw us into you know, a, a pit where each the, the most partisan elements amongst us were kind of neutralized by folks on the other side, it would give the parties an incentive to, to, to 
to nominate the right kind of people, candidates without the incentive to run that way, and the independent voters an opportunity to vote that way. That's what's missing in our politics today. And it, the technology that's being used against us is actually the cure for what ails us. Mm. But it has to be it has to be committed to that. We have to decide that's what we want. The politicians won't do it because they are products of the partisanship or they're prisoners of it, mm-hmm. either one or the other. But the courts are going to have to settle this thing for us ultimately. The courts had to deal with this problem when, the, when politicians in charge used the white primary to keep African Americans out of politics. When they used that to keep liberal uh, folks who are liberal on the civil rights issue basically out of power. Um, when they weren't discriminated against racially, they were discriminated against because of their politics. The white primary was used to, for that purpose, and the court struck it down. Then they used the county unit system to basically neutralize or, or, or to reduce the voting strength of folks who lived in, in, in the cities so that the rural vote, the more conservative vote, could have an, an unfair advantage in our legislature. Courts had to strike that down. This is nothing more than, a, than the next step in the long march toward making sure that that we all not have a not only have an equal right to vote, but that we have an equal opportunity to elect somebody who can govern for all of us. Here's the, the problem with gerrymandering is everybody's vote gets counted, but nobody's vote counts mm-hmm. because the election has already been decided. You have to nominate somebody who's got caught with a, a live woman or a dead boy in order to be able to beat somebody who was nominated by the party that district was drawn for. And that just, that just doesn't happen often enough. So that's why we're suffering from this polarization. I think that there definitely is a cure, but we're going to have to pursue this in the courts because that's probably where the only place it's going to come from. And it does seem like the Supreme Court is going to continue to see more and more gerrymandering cases on their docket. Do you have any sense one way or another where Judge Kavanaugh's going to fall on that spectrum? No, but I know the justice that he's going to replace was one of the leaders on this, one of the guys who saw this as a real problem and went against the grain to really address this issue. Um, uh, uh, Justice Kennedy was, uh, was, was real strong on this issue, and he's the one who's basically helped us get away from from trying to for, force this into into racial terms or uh, or to say that this is, an, uh, this is an issue the courts can't decide. He was committed to doing something. He kept this issue alive with his with his single vote on the court for two decades now. And it would be ironic if the person that was that, that, that has been chosen to succeed him would not pick up that mantle and carry it further. He really was the guy that I think we had the best hope of, of leading us out of this mess. I agree to a certain extent, but at the same time, he retired before really setting any sort of precedent. Tell me about it. <laughs> I know. I mean, he, he, really, he had uh, two great cases to work with in the last term of the Supreme Court, the Wisconsin case where the Republicans you know, stuck it to the Democrats, mm-hmm. and the Maryland case where the Democrats really stuck it to the Republicans. Mm-hmm. It was a perfect setting for them to address this issue. They basically kept it alive. But there's a substitution of, of, of a critical player, and it remains to be seen where Justice Kavanaugh will come down on this. I know this. I know that ultimately, ultimately, I know how this issue is going to have to be resolved unless we want to continue with the kind of politics that no one likes, everybody is unhappy with. And this is really sort of the, the deep inside the weeds, inside baseball reason for why our politics is as frustrating today as compared to what it used to be like. It's because we have basically hollowed out the middle uh, with partisan gerrymandering that has basically made all the districts in this country, some 95% of our districts in this country, more partisan than, than the rest of us, than the states that carved out of. And here's the ultimate irony. If your district has been drawn to be a reliably democratic district, whether the Democrats in your state are in the minority or in the majority, if your district's been drawn to be a reliably Democratic district, predictably, or if your district's been drawn to be a predictably Republican district, doesn't matter whether you're a Republican in California, whether they're in the minority, or a Republican in Georgia, whether they're in the majority, if your district's been drawn to be one thing or the other, and you're running to represent, what's the only election you ever, ever really have to worry about? Primary. It's your very first primary. Okay. Yep. Henry Waxman won his yep. first primary with 20-something percent of the vote. Mm-hmm. Ed Markey won his first primary with 30-something percent of the vote. Never looked back, never had any opposition for 30 or 40 years because that's, that's what their district was drawn like. If your district 
is such that the only election you really have to worry about for as long as you want to stay is your first primary. What's the only other election you'll ever have to worry about? Your next primary. And how do you make that problem go away? Well, if you're in a Republican district, you make that problem go away by being more Republican than anybody else in your district. Or if you're in a Democratic district, you're going to make the problem of the next Democratic primary go away by being the most Democratic person in your district. If the only place you can get flanked is in your primary, if it's a right flank in a Republican primary or the left flank in a Democratic primary, you're going to be the ultra partisan for that. Mm -hmm. So here's the ultimate irony of this. We got 95 percent of the districts in this country are drawn to be more partisan than the country as a whole. And the members who represent those districts are more partisan than their districts. That is the miracle of compound interest on steroids when it comes to partisan politics. we got to break the back of this. I think the oldest answer to this problem is competition, but it's got to be genuine competition. If the only competition is in the primary, then, it's the, then you're competing to see who can be more extreme. You've got to have competition at the general in order to tame the impulses of the partisans on both sides. And competition is easy to, to design if that's what you really want. Trouble is, the folks doing design and don't want it. Mm-hmm. They want. And Georgia, be- Georgia suffers from this. 85%, I think 80, 81, 85% of our state representative districts and state senate districts in the last general election were unopposed in the general election. It's not because the Republicans in Democratic districts are lazy or the Democrats in Republican districts are lazy. It's just they know better than to knock themselves out running to be a, a nominee in a, in, a, in a district where the the election, the general election, is a foregone conclusion. That's something we, we need to work on. That's something we can work on. And the Secretary of State has no power over this, but the Secretary of State, the office that I'm running for, has a remarkably important role to advocate on this issue. The Secretary of State has no seat at the table when the legislative district lines are drawn up by the legislature and signed into law by the governor. But the Secretary of State does have a seat in the courtroom Mm -hmm. where the constitutionality of these lines are ultimately going to be decided. And I think that's a it's a very important place to be. Someone needs to advocate for the underrepresented middle for the for the common sense center in this country. And no one's doing that if all of the players who are acting out this drama in the federal courtroom are all singing off of the same partisan song sheet. Whether it was the Democrats 20 years ago or the Republicans today, somebody has got to be in there advocating for the folks who are effectively disenfranchised in all of this. The folks who trot off to the vote, to the polls at general election time and vote, and their votes get counted, but their votes might as well not be counted because they don't count sure i could talk I, I i feel like i could talk to you about gerrymandering for a long time well, um, i'm the most gerrymandered <laughs> member of congress in history i used to tease my friend uh, john dingle my mentor he, he he served 60 years in congress and unlike mr waxman he represented a competitive district which meant, that's why his politics was so very different sure. i used to tease him you've been gerrymandered more often than me mr dingle but i've been gerrymandered more because i was moved from a district that that, that was very bipartisan to a district that was very partisan and and it happened to me more than once so but it's not it's this is really not a matter of what happens to the politicians personally it's what happens to the process and the politicians that we get it's what happens to the voters and the politicians they're stuck with that's that's the real issue of this and if i could i want to move on to an additional subject here i'd like to ask you about Healthcare and how we fix healthcare here in Georgia. I know during your tenure in Congress, you were one of a handful of Democratic votes to vote against the ACA. Well, there were thirty something of us, actually. I think thirty four. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Do you stand by that vote for voters here in Georgia who that's still a really important issue and appreciate everything that Obamacare and the ACA has done for them? What do you tell them? Well, first off. I think Obamacare was an example of legislative overreach by people who were in too much of a hurry to do too much too fast. And there were things in there that were half-baked that I don't think were uh, nearly as effective as they were ballyhooed to be. On the other hand, there were many things in there that I thought were extremely valuable, extremely necessary. Things like 
uh, telling the insurance companies, for example, that they can't discriminate against people on the basis of pre-existing conditions, ending the lifetime caps. It made absolutely no sense for an insurance company to spend a million dollars trying to keep someone alive. But when they reach the million dollar mark, they, they stop and the person dies immediately when they're just maybe another hundred thousand dollars away from a cure. Who knows? The point is there were many things the insurance industry was doing when they were not regulated effectively at the state level that I think were, were effectively addressed. And many people are benefiting today from those provisions of Obamacare without even realizing it. Kids who are able to stay on their parents' policy until they're 26. There are lots of things that a broad bipartisan majority of Americans like that are in this bill. What they didn't like was the fact the bill went so far into so many areas. It touched so many things it did not need to touch and done so in such a hurry-up fashion that it clearly was more a matter of politics than policy. And that's the reason why I voted against it, because I thought that the folks in this country were already paying too much for their health insurance in a largely, in an already unregulated market, were going to be asked to pay more than their fair share, even more, to try and extend the benefits of coverage to those folks who were excluded by the industry in an essentially unregulated marketplace. But here's an area where I think there was broad bipartisan agreement going into this thing. Here's the irony of this. Uh, if you, if, when, when folks were po- po- poking holes in Obamagare, pointing out how all these things were going to have unintended consequences, I could see the merit of a lot of those, and I, I acknowledge that in town hall meetings and, and with my votes. But if you If you turn the tables on folks, well, what do you think we ought to do? Almost invariably, there was a there was a broad bipartisan consensus that we need to fix what was broke with Medicaid. We need to expand Medicaid because it is a scandal. So many Republicans would tell you that Medicaid is so stingy in Georgia and yet so generous in California. And the federal government is an equal partner in the joint venture in both of those states. It just ain't right that poor people are squeezed to the, and really left without any effective health care at all in places like Georgia. But folks like California and New York were taxing themselves through the nose in order to be able to avail themselves of those matching federal dollars and doing, doing a much better job by their poor folks. If you asked folks, what, what do you think we should do? They all said we ought to do something about that. Well, again, the folks who designed this thing were so heavy-handed in their treatment of Medicaid expansion that it really ran afoul of the Constitution. The only part of the law... That was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court was the Medicaid expansion provision. And yet that was the only part of the bill that had broad bipartisan philosophical support at the beginning of the debate and all the way through. That's the one part where even folks who did not want to regulate the the insurance industry generally wanted to leave people at the mercy of the insurance companies still realized Medicaid is we got to fix the fundamental problem. That basically says the states get to decide how stingy they're going to be with their poor folks and the federal government's going to pay the bill. That needed to be fixed. And I think the debate we got right now going on in Georgia is, 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 is focused on the fact that the Supreme Court turned that from a mandatory program into an optional program. And the irony there is Georgia is paying its fair share of supporting Medicaid expansion in California and New York. But we're not getting any of the benefit of the money that New York and California are paying for the privilege of expanding Medicaid in Georgia. And we're the ones who needed it the most. We're the ones where our legislature was was the stingiest compared to others. We're the ones who's, who's working poor need the help of an insurance plan that doesn't penalize them for being poor but makes it possible for them to go to work and and not be a burden on their community or their community hospital. I mean – there's so many things we could we could go into on this issue. You asked me about my position. I think the position I took was right at the time. I think that the bill had many things in it that we needed. And those are the things that I voted to preserve and keep after mm-hmm. the bill had been adopted as in its entirety. Right. And we had lots and lots of opportunities to vote to keep parts of it or to get rid of parts of it. I voted to get rid of the individual mandate and the business mandate because of the unintended consequences that I thought were built into or engineered into those features of the law. I thought they were going to have adverse consequences that equaled or exceeded the benefits that they were going to confer in in the marketplace. So I stand by those votes. But when it comes to pulling off the mandates, the the, the effective regulation, the the worst abuses that the insurance companies were engaging in, I think that those needed to stay. And so like most centrists, 
when confronted with a highly partisan mix of things, you try and you try and stick with the good and get rid of the bad, you're going to get pilloried by both sides. Mm-hmm. And that's probably a pretty good indication that that's where, that's where the truth is, so that's where the better policy is to be found. If you're sure. getting beat up on both sides, it's probably, you know, all other things being equal, that's a good indication you're barking up the right tree. Sure. Well, Congressman Barrow, uh, I think that's all the time we have today. I could talk with you, I think, for another hour or so, but I do want to thank you very much for coming on the show for our listeners who want to find out a little bit more about you and your platform, uh, what's a good way to uh, learn a little bit about that or get in contact with you? Go to my website, www.barrowforgeorgia.com. You'll find commentary and articles on the campaign. You'll find a little bit about my, my background. You'll also find out about something about the folks who are supporting me in this race. Uh, the most important thing about this race that I'd emphasize, Secretary of State's probably the most important job that nobody knows anything about. But it's vitally important to the professional community, the licensed and registered professionals in the state. Seven, three, almost three quarters of a million small businesses depend on this office for the license that their professionals have got to have to do their business. That's hugely important. Uh, the business community, especially the small business community, depends on this agency like no other agency in state government. It has exclusive jurisdiction over the process of business formation and registration in Georgia. That's hugely important. And to all of us, all 10.1 million of us, it's important at election time because our Secretary of State is the person we hire to make sure that our elections are fair and our votes are counted the way we cast them. And that's the most important function for all of us all the time, if you ask me, because our elections are the means whereby we choose our elected official. That's the business of democracy. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show and for coming in person. Appreciate you being here. You're very welcome. Thank you. This has been the Inside the Box podcast, North Atlanta's number one local podcast. For bonus exclusive content, visit blackboxdocs.com. That's blackboxdocs.com. We welcome your feedback. Email us at pod at blackboxdocs.com.